you know, as you as you were talking, Reed, I was thinking um, that it seems highly likely that the company that produced Deep Seek was backed up by other significant resources, including probably state resources. You know, the thing about competing against China is they don't have a free market. And when I was senator and I would talk to companies that were doing uh, a lot of business, even when I was Secretary of State, it wasn't long before those businesses who had invested in China, brought their products and their services to China, suddenly got the knock on the door saying, hey, we want you to meet your new partner. We want you to meet uh, you know, the company that you're going to share your IP with. That set of behaviors has not disappeared. And so part of what I see is that most likely this is among the uh, very clear state goals that China has set for itself. Because AI not only has the benefit of you know, having an, uh, access to uh, a power that can tell you what to do with the ingredients in your refrigerator, but also uh, waging war, waging economic competition, controlling uh, populations. So maybe he spent six million on top of a huge state uh, investment. The, the second thing I, I would say is that um, it, it, it is really frustrating to me, as I know it is to you, we've, we've talked about these things, to have our country unable to stay focused on the future. And I think the CHIPS Act, I think the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, were really down payments on the kind of future that we're trying to create for uh, our country and, and continue to be uh, the leader in the world. And, you know, we've got to have more um, staying power, you know, longer attention spans. We've got to get over ourselves in order to be effective in this competition. I, amen. <laughs> so completely agree. And then the second part of your question, which is what are the things we should be doing? One of, we have uh, essentially national treasures both on the level of these hyperscaler companies, which you know are too often kind of described as, you know, just kind of only having villainous intentions, you know, like, and it's like, no, no, no there's actually all kinds of things that they do um, in providing what are like really great services. And it isn't just things like either Google Maps or Translate or, you know, the kinds of things that, you know, Microsoft and others provide to government and all the rest of these things. There's, there's a stack of those things, but we have AI capability both there amongst multiple of these hyperscaler companies having like just amazing talent, IP, drive, hard work. We want to enable the whole group there. And then we have an amazing number of startups, right? Not just, you know, Inflection and Manus, which are, you know, kind of the little engines that could that I try to help with. Um, but the... Uh, but I think it's the, we want a kind of a full court press, and part of that is, you know, what are the ways that we get to making that, uh, you know, kind of more realized as a America leading, you know, function. And we have some advantages, um, you know, like these companies and entrepreneurial uh, environment, although there is also a very entrepreneurial environment in China. Uh, and we have some areas where we have some deficiencies. Uh, you know, the onshore manufacturing of chips, the ability to have, you know, essentially uh, to, 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 regu to, to very quickly be able to uh, do all the uh, work to get good, clean, large data centers with clean energy and all the rest, that's an important part. There's a whole stack of things that I think need to happen here as part of the infrastructure for this. But it's basically, like try to accelerate the compelling players that we have and the fact that you know, we are um, certainly amongst uh, the leaders in entrepreneurship. And again, a little caveat to China, which is an intense thing, is the only place I've gone 
outside of Silicon Valley where I sometimes go, oh shit, we're moving too slowly, is China, <laughs> right? I mean, one of the things when I used to travel around everywhere in the world from Silicon Valley, it was like, oh, this moves a lot slower than we move. And part of like having written blitzscaling, the, 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 the game for uh, winning the technology kind of standards, platforms, companies, scale companies of the future is always in part a, a speed game. And so you have to win that speed game. And it's one of the reasons why like, I actually spent several visits in China trying to learn what are the things that they could do that we could also then learn from to bring back to Silicon Valley to say, hey, here's some of the things they've learned, let's do this too. You know, it used to be um, that we would say, you know, we remained the intellectual leaders, we remained the inventors, the creators, uh, but they were really good at, you know, taking what we've invented and then, uh, you know, going from there and creating industries out of it. And that a lot of what we used to do, like chip making, for example, or solar panels, things like that, migrated there. And it wasn't just because of, you know, uh, wages and other uh, conditions in our um, economy compared to theirs, it was because that's how they were organized. You know, we were really organized to create things and they were organized to replicate and, and learn from replication. And I, I think one of the perhaps uh, epiphanies now is that they've gotten creative. Um, they have gotten creative they have had enough practice, which is kind of your argument in super agency in a way. They've iterated and iterated based on what somebody else created enough so that they have learned from that and that has sparked um, you know, their own uh, innovative uh, capacity. And so we are in a, in a competition now that wasn't real. I mean, in the past, it wasn't real. You know, yeah, we lost manufacturing jobs, we did that, but we never lost our competitive edge. Now, what I hear you saying is that we perhaps could, if we're not careful. Yes, we, uh, we're in the game strongly, but it's much closer, right? And I think that part of it is that we wanna be doing everything we can to, like, here, here's one of the things, we're gonna, we're not gonna, uh, we all, should always be learning. This is one of the things that I love about Silicon Valley is it's, it's a constant learning machine, including learning from its previous failures. And so it's like, okay, we, we learn from other people all the time. Uh, but, of course, the way that we can get back to our competitive edge is, is by being, playing to our strengths, by being more American. It's not by trying to kind of like out-compete Chinese the way that they're doing, you know, whether it's subsidizing markets in intense ways, other kinds of things, state policy in certain things. That's not the, we do it by the American entrepreneurial networks and the creativity. But we have to go at that and we have to be saying, that's what we want. Well, you know, on your podcast, Possible, you recently uh, interviewed Dr. Fei-Fei Li, uh, who's just an extraordinary uh, person, a obvious technologist, Stanford professor, who is known um, as the godmother of AI. And she pointed out what she sees as a public communication flaw in the way we talk about uh, AI with language like, AI will cure cancer, or AI will solve climate change. Um, can you speak to that, and, and do you agree with Fei-Fei? Uh, and what was she really trying to uh, communicate herself about how we need to not only think differently about AI, but talk about it differently. Um, so, uh, Fei Fei's awesome, uh, partially because of Fei Fei, uh, the chair of the advisory council for Stanford's Human Centered AI Institute, which she co founded and co director of. Uh, and, you know, I think what uh, I think Fei Fei's overall arc was to talk about it something as a human endeavor, which is not only like, like we're not just trying to create these kind of alien robots. She also is very much not a doomer. Um, we, what, what we're trying to do is create these things that, that greatly Im, Im, improve human life and are 
are, are uh, focused on human design in certain ways. And I think what she's trying to do is get away from a little bit of the science fiction talk and a little bit more towards, no, this is for us in our everyday lives and you know the kind of stuff that she's doing with her spatial intelligence uh, work now and all the rest of it because it's like, hey, how do we have you know like robots that can help in hospitals and you know other kinds of things as part of this? Now, um, you know, the funny thing is I'll have to go back to her on this because I uh, uh, she knew that I was working on uh, Manus, but it's like no, no. Tell people what Manus is because this is very exciting. Yeah. So um, uh, Siddhartha Mukherjee, uh, who is a local uh, Columbia, uh, you know, professor. And um, I, I had decided about 18 months ago, maybe a little longer, uh, and went to my partners at Greylock and I said, look, I think there's gonna be a ton of very interesting, great investments in coding assistance, uh, productivity things, work companies, security stuff, a bunch of that stuff, I'll help with all of that. I don't think that people are really fully generalizing from the fact that these are, what, what does it mean that it's an amazing language capable, you know, kind of uh, amplification intelligence. Because yes, all those things, but what else? I was like, well, I tend to think that if you knew how to do the AI stuff together with the various bio and pharma stuff the right way, there might be some amazing unlocks here. So the way that I operate, and I said this is what I'm gonna go look at, the way that I operate is I immediately start going around talking to the smartest people I know, asking them what they think. I uh, had a number of dinners here in New York, with, you know, uh, Sid. Um, and <clears throat> one of the things that was really funny is I hadn't really appreciated that Sid had such an amazing track record as an entrepreneur. Obviously, emperor of all maladies, amazing. Professor, you know, amazing research in oncology. And so at like dinner three, <clears throat> Sid comes to me and says, you know, you know, I've done entrepreneurial work. I'm like, oh, I didn't know that. It's like, yeah, and by the way, with what we've been talking about with AI and the things that I know, I think we could do something here, <laughs> right? And I was like, oh, let's talk about it. And so basically, Sid walked me through the entire process of ideation to you know, clinical testing, to deployment of drugs. <coughs> and we looked at each part of it and said, where could AI make a 10x difference? Let's apply AI in those areas. Not do the kind of standard almost Silicon Valley thing, which is, oh, we'll just do all the research, it'll do everything in silicon, it'll just be all similar. Biology is too complicated for that. How do we do all of that? And then we went, oh, we think we got something, let's go. And that's the entrepreneurial impulse.